Hey everybody, welcome back to the channel. I'm going to assume that if you've made it to episode 3, that you've already watched episode 2. And if you're an experienced guitar repair person, the reason that you're here is probably because you're curious about how badly I screwed up the bridge placement. I get it. I wanted to know the answer to that question too, so I've completely modified uh, the sequence that I was planning on going with, but it wouldn't have made any sense to keep painting it and doing all that other good stuff if I knew that I was going to have to like re-drill the mounts for the bridge. So I went ahead and I put the entire guitar together without having touched the neck at all. There's good news and there's bad news. The bad news is it's screwed up. The good news is it's not so bad that it makes the guitar unusable. So before we go any further, let's talk about why bridge placement actually is so important. The reason why I wore the shirt today, right? These six strings, the strings need to follow the taper of the neck all the way down to the bridge. This needs to be centered so that when I go to play, I don't have strings hanging off the side of the guitar, or I don't have like a ton of real estate on one side or the other. Getting the bridge perfectly centered is how you do that. Additionally, you have to consider a distance. A lot of comments were made. The first thing that you have to consider is the scale length of the guitar. That is absolutely 100% correct. And I'm going to tell you where I made my mistake. I made an assumption. And that assumption was that whoever routed this body at the factory, back at Matsumoku, they had to route the pocket for the tremolo system in a way that would work, right? And I could use that pocket as the basis for where I would go ahead and mount it without having to put the neck back on, without having to do all the string adjustments and all that other good stuff. That assumption was flawed, but it was good enough. The guitar is still absolutely playable. The guitar still intonates, um, all of that good stuff. So, so again, I'm getting ahead of myself. For anybody who's not familiar with it, scale length is the distance between the nut of the guitar and the saddle of the guitar. Your scale length impacts how far apart your frets are. I am not a mathematician. I don't know what the formulas are. I just know the longer your scale length is, the bigger the gap is. If you're playing a 25 and a half inch scale guitar, then theoretically, the placement of the saddle should be exactly 25 and a half inches from the nut. But Adam, there's six strings on my guitar. Do all of them have to be exactly 25 and a half inches away from the nut? Nope. How do I know which saddle to use when I'm measuring the 25 and a half inches? The answer is the high E string, and the reason is physics. Here's a challenge for you. Any one of you that's watching this video right now, go grab a yardstick. Go grab your 25 and a half inch scale guitar. Put that yardstick on your high E string. Everybody with me? I promise you that if your bridge is properly set, the distance that you're going to measure between the very edge of the nut closest to the fretboard and where the string makes contact with the saddle will be greater than 25 and a half inches. Why? The answer is physics. Now, what I want you to imagine, right? See all these different frets that you've got on my shirt? By the way, does everybody get the joke? I hope so. Each one of these, when they're open tuned, I am bringing a string up to tension and the tension of that string at whatever the core size of that string is, is the thing that controls the frequency that that string will vibrate at when I pluck it. Now I want you to imagine that I'm gonna go in, we can even use my shirt as an example. Let's say that I bring this shirt up to tension and I go and I wanna fret at the second fret. What does that do to the shirt? You see how it warps it? I'm increasing the tension on that particular string. Increases in tension will always result in an increase in frequency. In other words, when you go to fret a note, it is physically impossible for you not to pull it sharp. The way that you play a guitar is by fretting notes. Doesn't matter what gauge of string you have in place. Every time you fret a note, you are increasing the inherent tension in that string. And in order for you to be able to counteract that increase in tension, what you have to do is you have to make the string longer. The way you make the string longer is by moving your saddles farther back from the nut. Now, since you got your ruler out, and since you have it up against your guitar right now, I promise you that high E string, it's gonna be the closest to whatever the scale length of your guitar is. Every other string that you've got on that guitar is gonna be set at some increment back. Why is that? Well, let's look at these dowel rods. Let's say that this is the diameter of your high E string. Let's say that this is the diameter of your low E string. Everybody see that by contrast? Is that working? It takes a whole lot more pressure to bend this beast to get it down to the fretboard than it does to bend this flimsy one right here. 
The closer you are to having no pressure in the equation at all, the closer you are to that theoretically perfect 25 and a half inches. The bigger your string is, the more pressure you have to use, the farther back the saddle has to sit to compensate for the size of the string itself. That's why you have these staggered string lengths. This is the least amount of pressure, right? Because it's the thinnest possible string. So this is going to be the closest to the true 25 and a half inch scale length. This is going to be a slightly bigger gauge, which means a slight teeny tiny amount more pressure in order to fret a note, which means intonation needs to be adjusted back. Moving it back makes the fretted note flatter than it would be if this was forward. Then you move on to the G string. This is the farthest one back of these three. Four is our first wound string. Hmm. Interesting. The wraps may not really have too much of an impact on how much pressure it takes, but a properly intonated guitar you will frequently see is up, slightly back, slightly back, farther up, slightly back, slightly back. One set of intonation for the unwound strings, one set of intonation for the wound strings. The string that will almost always be the farthest back because it is the biggest string involved in the mix is going to be that low E. Let's take a look at some guitars with bridges mounted from the factory that have been perfectly intonated. So let's think about how we can apply this. We can use this information to make bridge placement like way easier for ourselves in the future. If the 25 and a half inch scale length is the theoretically perfect scale length, move the high E string saddle out as far as it can go, as far as you're comfortable with it going. I want my saddle on that high E string to sit at exactly 25 and a half inches because no matter what kind of strings I put on there, the only answer is backwards. Set your placement using that high E string no matter what. By moving those screws forward, when you're setting the bridge for the first time, you are giving yourself maximum capability. Now, if you look at the way that this bridge is currently mounted, you can see the shift in the bridge that is the result of my error. This bridge, if it was tuned very slightly, bring it back a couple minutes on a clock, this saddle would sit slightly farther back from this one. So what's the moral of the story? I screwed up, absolutely. What I should have done is put the neck back on, put the tuning machines back on, put some strings on it, use those strings to sight the bridge so that it was perfectly down the middle, and then measure my scale length so that I was setting the pins with the saddles fully extended to marry up at 25 and a half inches, which is the scale length of the guitar. Here's what got me. This is a pre-routed body. This is not a situation where I was like placing a bridge on a guitar that never existed before. This was a guitar that already had a routed cavity. I made the assumption that that cavity was routed super precisely. It wasn't. But what I did doesn't make the guitar unplayable. It feels great. There's this old phrase, don't let perfection become the enemy of good. I'm not a professional luthier. I'm just a guy that likes to make old instruments work again. And this one works. Is it as precise as it would be from the factory? No, but who ever thought that that was gonna be the case? If, if there's a real lesson to walk away with here, it's one, don't make that mistake in the future. But two, if you do make that mistake, it's okay. Because somebody way smarter than us engineered adjustable saddles to be able to account for the flaws we make because we're human. Okay, so there you have it. I screwed up the bridge placement. You know, the big reveal is now out of the bag. Everybody's seen the sneak preview. How's about we get back to talking about what all had to be done to get here? I suppose the first thing we should talk about is the paint. As you can see, the color shift worked out pretty well. I would have spent more time recording what I was doing with painting, but God, I, I'm so bad at it. I'm so bad at it. I, there, there were three times in total that I completely botched the finish on this thing had to take it back down like to primer redo base coat why impatience working with the paint really wasn't that hard right like if I have any recommendations to throw out there number one um, use a matte black base coat 
the color shift paint when it comes out of the can. It's actually like a clear base. It's um, it's 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 a clear spray that has what looks like glitter in it, um, and the glitter is actually what kind of like causes that color shift effect. If you don't use black, it's not gonna work. I can tell you that with 100% certainty, but I did go with a gloss clear coat on it. Um, when you look at the guitar, it has the appearance of having kind of an orange peel thing going on. I, I did wet sand between coats, uh, gently, very gently. But I think that there's something about like this product doesn't like being clear coated or if it is gonna be clear coated, maybe it should be done with an epoxy or something like that. But whatever the case, what you see here, it's all Rust-Oleum products, Rust-Oleum primer. You have two coats of Rust-Oleum matte black base coat, three coats of the color shift paint, three coats of Rust-Oleum crystal clear uh, semi-gloss, no, gloss enamel. It took a total of about a week to get here. From there, go into doing the install and the electronics where I learned some more lessons. I don't normally like to do voiceovers on these videos, but this is probably the best way to go. Uh, here's a quick tip. When you're soldering the components together that are gonna go inside the cavity, take an old cardboard box, something that you're planning on recycling anyway, and uh, just trace the hole pattern from the cavity onto that box so that you, know, you can just put your components in it and do all of your soldering you know, away from the guitar. You're not gonna spill hot solder on anything you're you know it's going to be easier for you to reach all the things that you need to reach uh, and you're not going to you know be as likely to burn wires you know that kind of stuff this is a pretty standard humbucker three-way switch configuration the two things that are non-standard uh wait a second yeah this is my son about to pop into the screen here yeah he can't wait to get his hands on this thing but yeah, like I was saying, uh, standard configuration, two humbuckers, uh, three-way switch, coil tap, sorry, coil split. Uh, the one thing that's really interesting is that it does have a kill switch. Now, it's worthwhile to mention also that when I say standard configuration, we're using 500K um, audio taper pots and a 0 0.022 microfarad capacitor on the tone. The pickups themselves are from a company called Iron Gear. Uh, I don't see a lot of people really talking about them, but it's a fantastic company. I'll make sure to leave a link in the description below so that you can, you know, see what they're about. But for under a hundred bucks, you can have a customized set of pickups sent directly to you in the United States, and that includes, you know, shipping and taxes and all of that other good stuff. Two wire configuration, four wire configuration, P90, single coils, humbuckers, whatever you want. And I've been super impressed with the quality of every single set I've ever gotten. At this point, I'm just kind of moving right along. Everything's going the way that I think it should. I've never used a kill switch before. Um, this is pretty traditional for me. I'll use the screwdriver test uh, with the uh, guitar plugged in to see if I get any kind of output out of the pickups at all. I wasn't hearing anything. Uh, it was around this point that I discovered, oh wait, if I hold the kill switch down, I get sound out, which means that something is not wired correctly, like, at all. Okay. So my kill switch is wired backwards. I'll go ahead and put the uh, diagram up that I was working off of that got this from the Iron Gear website. Uh, not a bad drawing, uh, made it pretty easy for me. Uh, yeah, this is what it would look like if there was no kill switch being used at all. Once again, assumptions got the better of me. I just went ahead and guessed that the position of the kill switch, like the placement of it, was going to be on the hotline that leads between the volume pot and the output jack. That was wrong. This is a momentary switch, which means that like it only becomes active when you press it in and this, the default setting on it is open. So when you push the button, it closes a circuit. That's why the way it was originally wired, it wasn't going to work it's because if I wanted to get any sound to come out of the guitar, I would have had to have been pushing the button for those two leads to actually be connected to each other. The better place for this type of momentary switch to be mounted is jumpering the uh, ground lug and the hot lug on the jack itself because the second that you push it, it closes the circuit and it creates an inherent short. No sound can come out of the guitar. 
And it also really quiets all the crackles and pops that you get when you're messing around with the jack. All right. Let's see if that made any difference at all. The noise that you're going to hear at this point is because I haven't, like, grounded the bridge yet. I will. I promise. <laughs> Nothing there. Yes! It worked. It worked. Alright, now I gotta clean this off. The cover back on this. Ah! Given that we had to spend so much time addressing the flaws in the bridge placement on this video, we're going to go to episode four when it comes to conditioning the neck. I have not even started on the neck at this point, but I can tell you there is some pretty significant fretware, uh, especially up you know, above the fifth fret. Uh, all of that's going to have to be leveled out. Uh, it's going to have to be crowned. The fret ends are actually in really good shape, but the wood on the sides of the neck it's a little bit beat up some at some point it's pretty obvious to me that somebody has sanded all of the finish off of the back of this neck pretty convenient i'm pretty stoked about that i mean that's exactly what i would have done myself and again it indicates that at some point in its history this guitar was a player but we'll get to that in the next episode we'll talk about making sure the truss rod functions doing the fret work we'll talk about rolling the edges of the fretboard then do a basic setup on the guitar to you know get our intonation back to where we want it to be set our string height set our pickup height set up all that other good stuff and then last but not least you'll get your demonstration for how this bad herald sounds i sincerely want to thank all of you for leaving comments I, watching this video i mean or this series of videos like the number of views that I've gotten blows out of the water everything that I've ever done with fishing. Really appreciate y'all being here. I hope you stay subscribed to the channel because uh, I'm inspired, right, by the fact that you're engaging with me, that you're watching this stuff. I don't know what the future of it's going to be. I don't know if it's going to be the creation of a new channel that's dedicated just to rehabbing old guitars and learning lessons. But yeah, stick with me. If you like what I'm doing, leave a like, drop a note. Uh, if you have a particular guitar, like... It, it, a gem, not, not a gem, like an Ibanez gem, but some kind of hidden gem that you know about that you'd like to see restored, let me know. Again, thanks for watching, and as always, it's never too late to care again.